Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Warm welcome to this podium discussion on uh, research in solar energy with the title Research has delivered what is slowing down the expansion of solar energy, which I would like to direct a little bit more in the opportunities that actors from science, industry and politics see to further increase the role of photovoltaics in the energy system of the future. My name is Rutger Schlattmann. I lead a solar energy research institute here at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin and I'd like to introduce my guests to you first. On my far right is um, Samira Aden. She studied architecture at the University of Kassel and developed multifunctional building materials. She then went to Australia and did research on solar activation of building materials. And since 2019, she's working at the consulting office for building integrated photovoltaics at HEB, where she's been designing training courses for architects and planners and advising on the implementation of innovative solar solutions in architectural projects. I'm certainly looking forward to discussing with her the opportunities that urban integration of solar energy will offer. Second on my right here is uh, Dr. Simon Kierner. He studied industrial engineering at the Technical University in Berlin, got his PhD degree in 2013, and then worked as a postdoc here at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. And since 2016, he's been working at Oxford PV, an innovative solar cell company in Oxford, as well as in Brandenburg and the Havel developing novel technologies and, um, uh, and he's managing of the some of the programs there as well. Oxford PV uh, is a very innovative company and I'm sure that we'll hear a little bit more about the innovative technical solutions that they are aiming to bring to the market. So welcome Simon as well. And on my left you can see uh, Mr. Klaus Mindrup. He's a biologist by training and a politician for the Social Democrat Party here in the German Parliament, the Bundestag, since 2013. And he's a member of, on the Committee of Construction, Housing, Urban Development and Committees and um, Communities and the Committee on the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. So even broader than the topics that we will discuss today, but he's been co-speaker of the Climate Protection, Protection Support Group of the SPD, the Social Democrat Party. And uh, he was also until 2014 uh, Deputy Chairman of the Independent Institute for environmental issues, as well as a member of the board of the German Wind Energy Association from 2009 until 2013. I'm sure, Mr. Mindrop, welcome here, that we'll have lots of issues to discuss with you as well to bring further solar energy in Germany and in the Thank world. Thank you. Finally, on my far left and far right for you as viewers is uh, Professor Steve Albrecht. He's a leading scientist here at the uh, Helmholtz Center in Berlin studied physics at the University of Potsdam and did his doctorate on solar cells in 2015. Since then, he's been leading the young investigator group on Proskite tandem solar cells, and we'll uh, surely hear more about those uh, very soon. And he's actually with his group, and, uh, but the groups that he leads, uh, holder of two world records for the highest efficiency for this type of novel solar cell. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. He's won a number of prestigious awards, including the Berlin Science Prize in 2019, and the Apple of Inspiration in Slovenia in 2018. And since 2018 as well, he has a junior professorship at the Technical University of Berlin. So to start the discussion, uh, I'd first like to give the, each of the guests a brief opportunity to make some opening statements, and then we'll dig into the topics uh, that are relevant for solar energy. If you, as an audience, have any questions, of course, you can participate in the chat. And if you don't have the opportunity to directly write into the chat, you can send an email to the address um, at the top of that list, which is solar energy at Helmholtz Center Berlin, but you can see it in the YouTube uh, chat uh, section on the side. So first, let me give the word to Samira Aden for an opening statement. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, first, I would like to say I'm really happy to participate in this talk today in the Berlin Science Week and uh, to put in, to bring in um, an architecture view in this topic and why architecture um, plays a key role in the transformation of the energy system towards uh, renewable energies um, and how can we achieve this in architecture um, is um, the fact that we can implement uh, photovoltaic materials into the building skin, in the overall building skin, and um, then they will act as building integrated photovoltaic systems. So the building itself becomes an uh, energy hub in the city and um, is 
the same time consumer of energy at the same time, but even producer, and is part of a decentralized energy system. And the photovoltaic mater material in the, as building integrated photovoltaics um, will transform to a building material. And that means it has to fulfill um, certain requirements like technical, economic, and especially aesthetic requirements and qualities. Um, to be accepted in the architectural world, but at the same time in the construction world and even in the society, because this is our built environment. And when there's no acceptance from the society, I think we won't be able um, to push photovoltaics in buildings forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So solar cells as bricks, to put it very briefly. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Rutka, for the introduction and for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, photovoltaics today is already one of the cheapest methods to produce energy with um, like two cents per kilowatt hour in sunny regions of the world and I think around four cents per kilowatt hour here in Germany. At Oxford PV, uh, we're trying to work on innovative solutions such as a um, perovskite silicon tandem solar cell to further reduce the cost um, of photovoltaics and at the same time um, produce new and um, s uh, keep innovative jobs here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Mr. Mindrup? Yeah, thank you for the invitation, too. As a politician, I deal with regulation. But I'm not only a politician, I'm a member of a cooperative movement in Germany and uh, I live in a cooperative house uh, in Prenzlauer Berg and we have rooftop solar and uh, 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 on our roofs and we have uh, combined heat and power in our, our basement uh, so we are have a, 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 an own um, uh, legal we, we had to uh, improve an, an old legal but an legal body uh, uh, an own uh, an own cooperative about our regulation and to act as a prosumer to produce uh, electricity to produce heat and power because the regulation in Germany is a, a big problem for uh, decentralized uh, energy produ production and um, this is a, an awful history in Germany because we have uh, many people have a think that only centralized solutions are good solutions but I think this future is a democratic and uh, um, a, a bottom-up solution is necessary and uh, I'm part of it but uh, only as a member of parliament often people say to me that this is not the right way but I think it's the right way and uh, that, uh, there is a huge potential for uh, PV in the cities on the roofs and on the facades and we have have to use it and uh, that there's enough energy uh, that we can um, harvest in the cities and uh, that is as cheaper than an only centralized energy system but we have to um, we have to the, the, uh, and you have the renewables there's a twin this is the storage uh, you need storage too and uh, uh, so you have to have a storage regulation this is it for the beginning and I, I hope for a very interesting discussion and uh, maybe you you, you uh, can recognize this. my English is a little bit rusty because uh, I'm not uh, used to it because we had not the possibility to go outside and uh, discuss in English but uh, I try to improve it in this uh, debate. Thank you. Thank you very much and finally on my far left um, Steve Albrecht. Please Steve. Yeah thank you. Uh, thank you very much Rutger. Um, so the first statement that I want to uh, include here in our discussion today is how we can inspire people and uh, therefore I would like to share with you how I was inspired by uh, uh, photovoltaics. When I was uh, studying at high school, uh, you usually get uh, taught in the very first lectures that uh, the amount of energy or the amount of power that is provided by the sun in just one or two hours uh, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere and in the Earth's surface, if you can convert all that power or energy and you can use it, that is enough for the energy demand that the whole uh, population needs in one year. So this relationship inspired me most to work on PV and this is why I'm here today. And I would like to also inspire the Berlin Science Week uh, community by this statement. And uh, I think there's, there's a very bright future for photovoltaics and, and solar cell research in general in the next decades. And I think for that we need, uh, of course, we need uh, young investigators and they need to be inspired. And I think they need to be inspired by the scientific community. And that's why this is my first statement today. I'm also looking forward to a nice discussion round with you now. 
Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you all. Uh, of course, this directly gives a point where I'd like to uh, connect to, uh, I think, in the year there's almost 9,000 hours, so there really is a lot more energy to be harvested. And um, still, the technical potential that we have at the moment for solar energy is, is whatever we put on the roof or onto the fields or onto the buildings at the moment. Is, do you see much improvement potential still, or is it almost at the end of its development stage? Um, so the question is it, whether you generally think about solar, then yes, there is potential, but uh, the, the technologies that we have available at the moment, they are almost at their end of fundamental efficiency limits, so-called single junctions, so a solar cell that works by itself. But if you combine, let's say, the single junction or the solar cell with a tandem partner, like in a tandem bicycle, so you put two riders either on the bike or you put two solar cells into a, solar, uh, into a photovoltaic module, um, then there's more, even, uh, even a higher potential for energy harvesting. And like in the next decades, uh, there's a strong potential for those tandem technologies to improve in efficiency and with that also in energy yield and power production. Mm -hmm. Do you, just to give the, the audience an idea, is that a potential of 10% extra, 20% extra or 100% extra? So, the, roughly speaking, it's a potential of 10 to 15 percent uh, for, for going from a, a single partner to the tandem partner. And then, of course, you can add up more, right? Think about a, a bicycle that is, has, I don't know, 100 riders on, on its bike. Uh, so, you can also have a solar cell that consists of 100 different uh, photovoltaic active materials, and then the potential is even higher. So, the, then you're speaking about fundamental uh, potential gains from what we have now of let's say 20% and above. Okay, but this is in absolute terms. So it's a factor one and a half more, a factor of two more. Yes. Right? So, of course, that's the, the technical potential. Maybe we get the chance to get into the detail a little bit more. But the, uh, of course, it's known that there are already more efficient solar cells. So why are you developing, for instance, in your company, these cells, even though there are better cells? with higher efficiency on the market already? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it always starts with the material research, I think. And um, I think Steve's group and uh, um, the Helmholtz Center in, in general is, is one of the leading uh, scientific um, groups in, uh, worldwide um, to, to uh, come out with new materials. And um, uh, my colleagues in, in UK, they... Um, or the Henry Snay's group, for example, at, at Oxford, they, they uh, found this, discovered this new material and um, combined it with already quite efficient uh, silicon solar cells um, to leverage these, these advantages of the tandem technology that, that Steve mentions. And um, you're, you're right, there are um, more efficient cells um, that, that haven't re quite reached the market yet. Um, but um, with the tandem technology, I think... Um, um, Oxford PV can go even beyond these more efficient cells that are in the or just approaching the market. Mm -hmm. In the in the beginning, you said something on the the cost of electricity, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess in the end, for most people, they do not care so much what the what the technology is, but they care about what the electricity costs. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the? Uh, you said that it's already. Uh, you said mentioned number like two or four cents per kilowatt yeah. hour. Can you put it a little bit in relation to the to the numbers um, that we pay as customers, or that you can get with uh, fossil fuels or other technologies? Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm not. I'm not an energy expert. Uh, I'm, I'm more on the development side of the cell. But I think um, in for the, the cheapest um, the cheapest form to generate electricity i think is probably a, a nuclear power plant or a, a lignite um, power plant if you don't consider the so called external effects um, for, um, these these um, lignite or, or hard coal power plants of course emit a, a lot of co2 into the atmosphere and um, these um, these the CO2 emissions cause what uh, what's economically known as external effects. So um, wh whatever we see here um, in the in the um, influence of the um, cl climate change. So um, if you don't uh, consider these external effects, um, nuclear or or coal is probably still cheaper, especially here in Germany. Um, I don't think for nuclear. I think nuclear is um, one of the most expensive 
Is it, uh, is it okay? Yeah. Well, well maybe I was. Uh, I was reading yesterday something about the marginal cost. So maybe the marginal yeah, cost. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. 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 So if yeah, if you if you take into account the, um, the investments, yeah, you're, you're probably right. But um, yeah, coming back to your question, um, the um, improving the cell efficiency, of course, is a is a huge lever to reduce the cost of. Um, um, photovoltaic. So, if you, um, like Steve mentioned, re um, add another 10% or so to a already 20% um, efficient module, you have a factor of um, uh, 1.5, and this would go directly or even more um, into the into the electricity cost of the photovoltaic. And the the extra cell, so the second uh, driver on the tandem bike. Yeah. Is that is it more expensive or similar, or how does it compare? Um, so, in, in our calculations, the, um, w w the 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 material cost of the perovskites are f uh, very low, very low compared to the um, to the, the silicon-based um, cell, because uh, the amount of energy you have to put into the um, silicon is very high, and um, this is the main cost driver or one of the main cost drivers for silicon photovoltaics today. And um, this thin layer of, uh, of perovskite, what we put on top of this uh, silicon base cell, is uh, only adding not more than, t uh, let's say, 20% uh, of, of the cost. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the calculation would be you get 50% extra, factor one and a half, you pay 20% extra. So. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, th this is only on the on the cell level, and then you put the cell into a module, and the module into a uh, into a PV system, and um, what what um, so you you only uh, these twenty percent are only adding to the cost of the cell, right? And uh, but the whole system is is improved by by the um, by the improvement. In you need less area. You need, you need less, less area. Exactly. Yeah. Shorter cables. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mindrup, the discussion at the moment, of course, is, is all often uh, on many factors for renewable energies, but usually uh, it seems, but I, I wanted to get your opinion on it, but it may seem that the, the cost reduction for solar has not reached all uh, deciding politicians uh, already. Is that your impression too? Yes, this is really a big problem. This is about our Renewably, uh, Renewable Energy Act. Uh, it is 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago it was implemented, the feed-in tariff. And uh, we started on a really high level for the feed-in tariff. And uh, it, uh, the feed-in tariff um, uh, uh, works for 20 years. So uh, we have a, an economic rock sack for 20 years. And uh, many of my colleagues uh, don't recognize that uh, today the prices for um, PV is much lower than 10 years ago and 20 years ago. So uh, four cents, four euro cents is right. Uh, so we have new auctions and uh, they don't recognize that uh, PV gets cheaper and cheaper. Even... Um, uh, not also uh, not uh, also ground mountain also rooftop solar and uh, for the prosumers and uh, this is a big problem because they don't recognize uh, the actual uh, situation the actual prices and uh, they think it's uh, it's uh, too expensive and uh, it doesn't work and uh, so we, uh, always we have this debate in the parliament and I say it's incredible it's uh, cheaper and it's better so we have to use it and uh, we have uh, to yeah, to use it in higher numbers, and uh, this is very important. We had a very crazy debate in our parliament about the 20, uh, uh, 52 gigawatt uh, cap for uh, PV in, in Germany. It was incredible. Many people think we had to stop uh, 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 um, financing PV, and it was really a hard debate in the parliament and uh, for uh, the Social Democratic Party in the coalition uh, to win this fight against uh, the Minister of, for Economy. Do you think it will help that the International Energy Agency, which is not usually has been historically a friend of renewables, has recently, uh, I think a week or two ago, brought out this report where the chief economist or even the chief of the agency declared solar the king of electricity? 
yes, or something uh, like this. Yes, yes, it, 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 yes it, it, it helps. Uh, um, but in, uh, we have to see that in other countries uh, there isn't the EEG rucksack. So we, we paid a lot of money for the development in the whole world. If uh, 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 Germany uh, uh, wasn't the, uh, uh, the Germany was, was the front runner for this development, and uh, it, it was important for, for the whole world. But this helps, and uh, the, the situation and uh, the policy. Uh, of the uh, European Commission helps too. So uh, the, the, uh, the European, EU yeah, the EU Commission, the European Commission, they, they EU Commission, they are very, uh, they help prosumers. They say that uh, PV is uh, very important. That we have to have an own PV production in Europe, in, and uh, what we have to encourage the companies, that we have to help the companies to invest, and uh, that we have to have an. an friendly environment uh, for the PV production. And uh, this is uh, much different to the situation in, in Germany. There the parliament is split, split in, uh, yeah, I think in, in, in three parts. We have uh, the pro-solar parts and the progressive parties, and my party is uh, progressive in uh, two, and we, we want it. And we have uh, some politicians that say, oh, don't have such uh, not they, they are not against solar, but uh, they think not so fast, not so much, and we have uh, the right wing, wing uh, uh, a, a so called AFD. They were strictly against solar, and so the parliament is is, is, is divided into these uh, three uh, uh, three different groups, and uh, it's, it's a, a problematic situation to find a consensus. And uh, so it's very important to have such discussions to tell the people there is a potential, and it's cheaper and it's better. And it's all good for our, our economy too. And uh, but not everybody wants to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we see new. I mean, of course, Oxford PV was one of the first in very uh, recent times to come back to Germany to start solar production. Uh, I think there's further companies starting to expand uh, their activities again uh, in Germany and Europe. Do you actually see this back at university, Steve? Do you see more students? Again, for the for the education, uh, the solar subjects, um, which are a good barometer for public. Uh, um. Actually, that's a very good question. Um, so, of course, uh, we as a non-university institute, uh, we do have a lot of PhD students, right? And uh, typically, those PhD students they need to change from university to our institutes. Um, and uh, it, it's not so easy to grab whether now uh, solar in general is a very hot topic for, for those PhD students or for students in general, or whether it's more battery research or hydrogen or whether there's other, other aspects that are more interesting. So there, there is interest, yes, and of course there's also interest for especially those new materials that we're working on that we try to integrate into solar cells like new solar materials. Um, so I would say yes, but it's it's also very, uh, it's not an easy question. So it's not not an easy answer. So it's not an, a straight yes or no. I need to say. Yeah, we'll get back to the the, the topic of uh, of storage and hydrogen for sure. As uh, outside it's dark, so the generation of electricity at the moment will be somewhat lower. Uh, uh, but I'll, I'll park that for a second. I, I wanted to come back to some people are against uh, or opposed to solar, as Mr. Mindrup explained, uh, for, for many reasons. One of the reasons could be cost, which is an argument which doesn't count so much anymore if you take the actual numbers. Um, but another factor is that uh, I think that if you have very large installations of solar, you will see them on the fields more than you will now. And of course, this is one of the aspects, uh, Samira, I think where, uh, where integration into buildings could play a role. Do you see any, uh, any growth in, in the interest for, um, for building integration, apart from the fact that it may not be so easy, but do you, see, do you see an increased interest in your time? You've been working on it for a while. Yeah, so um, yes, I see uh, a huge interest even from the architect's side because actually they're willing to design buildings uh, through sustainable um, like principles and one way to do it is one way is um, like using materials like wood or you know, make using less uh, concrete. But at the same time, when we start thinking about um, how can we generate energy for our buildings, it's, um, it's obvious to use then 
in one part PV or photovoltaics. And um, I see there's a big will to do it. At the same time, um, we see in, for example, like high-rise buildings where it's really um, actually a big uh, advantage to, to use them as PV plants in buildings. Um, we have we see some yeah, restrictions and some um, borders for architects because it's really not so easy to implement these elements in the building. And um, this is something we are actually working on, but it's everything solvable. But I think when the politics will more push the regulations in the right way, I think it's absolutely possible and it's not so far away. I think it will be more implemented than in buildings. Because what um, you, you see uh, is mostly regulation uh, related, that it's yeah. not so easy? Or what, what are the main factors that you yeah. observe are hindering further growth if interest is large? Yeah. So it's actually the regulation um, about the material itself. So what, what happens is we, we take a photovoltaic material, what's actually an electrical device for architects, and we transform it to the building as a construction material. And the regulation itself um, for photovoltaic materials are not really um, made for... Um, as it's not accepted as a construction material itself. So it starts that we have small barriers, like we have to describe it differently. And um, I think it would be um, really helpful um, that this material just um, treated like a normal construction material and has an add-on as electrical device. And um, I think that will help. Yeah. The, another factor that you mentioned is the it should be accepted by architects, I guess by the people who pay the architects <laughs> of the buildings as well. But the, just yeah. sticking to the architects first, you're, you're an architect yourself. Yes. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. One of the factors that I've m heard mention every now and again is the appearance of solar cells yes. and uh, do you think there's sufficient opportunity to actually for architects to to happily embrace this material or is it more that they're driven by uh, by environmental uh, concerns or uh, or wishes i think it's a combination of both so um i think first the first fact is that um i think architects want to really um try to have the sustainable factor, but when it comes then to implement it in buildings under aesthetic um, view or qualities, then we, what I see is sometimes that we have a, um, even, um, um, a kind of restrictions even about is the model size or is the haptic of the material, the optics, but there are a lot of solutions that we find like colorful um, PV elements in printing or flexibility, even in the, yeah, instead of glass, glass, like flexible device, like in perovskites at the moment. Um, but it's not really so wide like other materials at the moment. So I see it's in the beginning, but there's a big will of, um, that is soon coming and uh, we can choose a variety of aesthetic um, yeah, uh, opportunities. Is it right that mm -hmm. you've just uh, uh, accompanied the installation of a large blue uh, building face here on the on the campus? Ah, uh, yes, it is um, here at the yeah, Atlas Hof. We just um, there's a uh, like a it's a we call it real labor. I don't really <laughs> don't know how to say it in English. Um, a real lab lab mm -hmm. and uh, lab, living lab. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, where we have CIGS elements and there are even a BIPV and have a chromatic um, um, covering. And um, it's really beautiful, <laughs> at the first of all. Yeah. So people interested in looking at that can come to Atlas Hof and take yeah. a look on what's possible, for instance, with such a large building. Yes. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Well, Mr. Mindrup, there's a clear uh, call for you, I think, in regulations. You mentioned that you live in a communal building. The yeah. This probably brings together all of the regulatory problems connected to <laughs> integration, right? Yes, that's right. But this was a new problem. I didn't know. Um, um, we have mostly problems with tax regulation. And uh, mm -hmm. so uh, it's a problem for companies, uh, uh, um, uh, um, landlord companies, I think is the right word. Um, um, it's a problem for them. They, they have a tax problem if they sell electricity. And uh, even if they uh, um, have an own company for selling electricity, they can get tax problems in Germany. And uh, the, the other problem is uh, the, EEG, uh, the EEG surcharge. You have to pay when you um, sell electricity uh, um, um, 
to uh, your tenants and uh, the regulation is really a problem and uh, we in our uh, caucus we want to uh, implement a strict regulation that you uh, that every new rooftop has to have solar on it and uh, this is a regulation california started uh, early this year but uh, uh, I, I can say maybe it's the right, it's the uh, PV duty. You have to have on the other side the PV right for the, uh, for the people to use it efficiently and uh, don't have an awful bureaucracy to, to use it. And I think it's, it's necessary to have both. And uh, uh, we are working on it. And, uh, and maybe, as you know, we have in the moment the debate in uh, the German parliament about the reform of our energy, uh, renewable energy law. And uh, in the moment we discuss it, and we have a lot of um, um, people think that uh, a reform is necessary, and the EU, EU Commission thinks it too. And uh, um, our second chamber, the Bundesrat, uh, they made a very good decision for uh, uh, these models too, uh, as, as I say, prosumer models. And uh, this is important uh, for PV that you can use the electricity for yourself and uh, don't uh, 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 only uh, uh, use it to uh, uh, put it in the grid. And uh, so it's very important to have a decentralized model and uh, in the moment we are negotiating it with our coalition partner and uh, we have some colleagues from our coalition partner who also think that it's necessary to have a reform they published a pa paper on friday so i'm hopeful that we can get really a good reform mm -hmm. yes there seems uh, lots of opportunity for uh, lowering the the hurdles more than the uh, than increasing the technical potential but since of course this is science week we also like to still keep an eye on the uh, on the scientific aspects as well as the um, uh, as the integrative uh, parts and the political parts w one thing that i parked briefly but i want to come back to uh, now maybe first starting with uh, you steve the do you see a role for uh, for photovoltaics also in in terms of uh, uh, storage hydrogen uh, any of the technical potential are there any things uh, up the road that we can see coming. Of course, we have a thousand hours of sunlight uh, a year in Germany, and the other 7,000, the sun is not shining. Um, yeah, sure, of course. I mean, during night and during winter, you don't have a lot of solar energy, right? So you still want to, uh, so you need to do something about it. So, of course, uh, y we need to work on, on, on uh, like storage, on like seasonal and uh, daily storage. Uh, but if we think about like chemical storage, uh, let's say hydrogen, uh, then of course you also want to generate the hydrogen. So the hydrogen doesn't come for free. Sunlight is for free. So uh, we, when we uh, talk about hydrogen, we always talk about green hydrogen. So that means we want to use renewable energies to generate the hydrogen. Uh, and then we can use this hydrogen as a chemical storage or, or uh, as another driver for other things. Um, so yes, also solar and photovoltaics in general is very important also uh, for, for uh, the, the, the hydrogen or the politic decision that, that, has, uh, that Germany has taken now or will take to, to improve or increase the amount of hydrogen that, that is used in, in, different, uh, in different energy demands for Germany. So yeah, clear yes. Okay, so a hydrogen can only be green if, if the electricity comes from the sun or wind or... Yes. Similar. Or, or other renewables, yes. yes. Is that something that you are looking into as well with your company or you personally, Simon? Um, well, not directly, but um, of course, if you want to uh, uh, convert or store energy, you've, like Steve said already, you have to generate um, energy first. Um, and of course, it has to be as cheap as possible because you're adding extra costs um, for because, of you s be because you want to store it. Um, so, um, yeah, via um, reducing the cost of um, clean energy with our technology, I think we're contributing um, to uh, also um, allowing to have cleaner um, and, and storable energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. I think, um, I think I saw a question coming through uh, that actually uh, disappeared again from my... But I think it was to do still with the... Uh, uh, House with different owners, which I think is uh, what you refer to too. So I, I just come back to that question because I don't want to uh, ignore it. Of course, the um, so do you want to? You can read the question too. So the is there is there a way to to 
make it less complex for, for, um, for in urban situations, most of the people don't live houses in that, that they own by themselves. So you need some way of being able to install and share the, um, uh, the maybe the cost, but also the, the gains of your solar installation. I think uh, the question or the answer to this question is the EU regulation. The EU regulation wants uh, that it is possible that uh, different uh, people can, uh, yeah, uh, can come together and uh, uh, harvest the solar together and uh, share the social harvesting. And uh, so uh, they have a good prosumer regulation and I hope we can... Uh, in, uh, can uh, have the progress and in, and have the same right in Germany, but it's a political controversy. Controversy in in Germany we have uh, the time to install these. It's the renewable uh, regulation. We have to Im implement it in German law until um, the next year, I think June or July. And uh, some uh, and bureaucrats think we don't have to do it. I think we have to do it. And uh, many colleagues uh, from uh, the European Parliament think it too. And they want uh, to help people that they can use the electricity on the rooftop and uh, put away these all for bureaucracy. So I, I know the question for myself. And we, we uh, solved it uh, in creating or having a new uh, uh, company, a, a new cooperative, only for our energy uh, system. It's not necessary if uh, the regulation would be simpler, more simple. So now there will be a EU directive which has to be made into German law. Yes. And you have half a year to do so yeah, if but, you want to do it. But but our Ministry for uh, econo Economy and uh, um, Energy, they think it's not necessary. They think uh, the EU regulation uh, uh, there, there, there is, uh, what can we say, Ausnahme, there is, uh, 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 yes, for, for Germany, but uh, I disagree, and uh, a colleague of mine, we started, uh, 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 well, we questioned the European Commission, and uh, um, if uh, the, uh, our ministry is right or not, and I think, um, uh, uh, we have to implement uh, the European law, and this would help because uh, people can uh, uh, can uh, yeah, energy sharing is, is the, the right name. They can they can share energy from their own rooftop, and uh, and it is uh, it's strict European right. But there, we disagree in, in the coalition. It's the, uh, the, uh, the Social Democratic Party. I'm a member of my caucus, I think it's necessary to implement it, and uh, some of our coalition partners they also agree but uh, the, uh, the ministry disagrees. Mm -hmm. It's well, as politics. We've learned, yes. Thank you. Well, as we've learned from the United States in the past weeks, and maybe from the Brexit uh, situation or whatever, it is important to go voting. So I think that's certainly a general remark. Even if you're interested in science, it doesn't hurt to go voting. I saw one question uh, which was actually probably directed... Um, well, to probably to Simon or to uh, Steve. The question is, there's a huge gap of lifetime between perovskite PV and silicon solar cells. Does it really make sense to tandem them in terms of the real-world application? I think, uh, particularly from mains electricity, I think I'd give the question to Simon because you've probably done most work on yeah, yeah. solving this problem. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's right that um, some of the first, the early developments of these uh, new perovskite uh, technology, they, they had um, intrinsic... Um, intrinsic um, problems with the stability. So the material was not stable against uh, all kinds of um, influences, uh, even light to some, uh, for some um, materials. But as the uh, um, development moved on, uh, we found uh, the right compositions that uh, make, uh, that, that, that um, uh, to find the right material that is also intrinsically stable. And um, then it's only a matter of how well you encapsulate. And, and uh, we are at Oxford PV. Uh, we have uh, the right technology to encapsulate them properly, and um, we, we think we will reach the same uh, lifetimes as uh, silicon technology. But you're probably doing accelerated lifetime testing, which we, is the usual. Yes, we, we do excessively um, and extensive um, lifetime tests uh, according to all the uh, common norms that are also used for uh, silicon uh, technology, so these IEC um, protocols. You're not worried about, uh, you're less worried than the person asking the question about the lifetime. You see no problems. Well, I mean, it, um, it, it is, um, let's say, 
you have to take you have to be more careful because material is um, is not like silicon uh, in, in terms of stability, but um, if you do um, the encapsulation right, then uh, this is, uh, you can achieve the similar or same lifetimes. So not anyone can do it, but you can. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Steve, I want to connect to this question. It's a little bit uh, further away, but if, if we think about uh, not just uh, gigawatts or 52 gigawatts, but really about terawatts of solar, so worldwide enormous amounts of solar electricity, then even more than now, the sustainability aspect comes into play as well, and how much energy you've put in, for instance, for the silicon. Would you also see an opportunity not just to tandem with silicon, but to completely replace the silicon with something which has a lower environmental footprint? Um, yeah, in principle, yes. I mean, uh, of course, silicon has the, uh, the uh, strong advantage to be the market domi dominating technology at the moment. So. More, well, more than 90% of, of uh, every solar is, is silicon. But the, the new material we're talking about, the perovskites, they are very versatile. So it's not just one material like silicon with this property, but it is so versatile that you can change the material properties. And with that, you can change also certain, let's say, optical properties that are needed to uh, to tandem up uh, or to team up with other solar absorbers. So in principle, it would be possible to uh, create a tandem solar cell that doesn't need silicon at all. So it can be simply made and purely made from perovskite, from different perovskites. And uh, then you would have a very uh, low-cost uh, technology that combines all the advantages of this tandem technology uh, with the high uh, efficiency potential in the end. And uh, those materials are uh, abundant. Uh, they are very cheap to produce. Let's say the energy that you need to uh, put into the systems to create those materials and those films is very low. You can apply very simple um, techniques like printing. Um, you can, in the end, you can even print your solar cell like you would print your newspaper. So it could be very, uh, very fast and very cheap. So yes, there is the potential. But on the other hand, of course, uh, there's material research that needs to go into those materials. Um, some of those materials, uh, they, they still have um, uh, stability issues because they're quite new. I mean, those material class in principle is quite new, right? We are talking about a decade of research. So 28, 29, uh, so 11 years from today, there was the first solar cell made with those materials. I mean, those materials aren't, aren't new. They were explored 100 something years ago, but, but to include them into solar was 10 years ago. So um, I, I think if we have, from today, if we have a, a more than a decade of research, we will potentially also explore more materials that, that, uh, uh, that have all the uh, benefits uh, of the materials that we have today, but maybe not the downsides of stability. And then we, we truly have a very stable, uh, very sustainable, and very low cost, high efficiency tandem potential. So what's, what's the potential today for this for this kind of technology maybe we maybe we don't want to wait for 10 more years before it's that far yeah um, until 2015 you can count backwards it's 30 years from now um, so comparing the potential let's say let's compare the the numbers that uh, uh, research labs get today mm -hmm. so for perovskite on silicon I, I think we are close to getting 30 percent for lab-based record devices um, it's your own world record. Yeah, let, let's say we are 20 above 29. Uh, um, so, but I, I think the, the community, the research community, will see the 30% someone in the near future. Um, and for those uh, perovskite, perovskite tandem solar cells, um, the, the record at the moment also lab scale um, small areas and, and putting a lot of effort into, into single devices is in the order of 24 to 25%. So it's, it's not that far off, right? So it's, let's say, absolutely still 5% off. Uh, but, but in, let's say, fundamentally, they have very similar uh, efficiency limits that are well above 30%, both of them, in the order of 33, 34%. So uh, potentially, uh, five or ten years from now, they can have the same efficiency, the, the same practical efficiency and uh, the same uh, potential to be upscalable. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, we can't predict it now, but uh, w whatever will be more cost-effective and uh, has the same uh, good properties will survive and potentially also dominate the market. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I, um, I want to come back very briefly to the concept of storage because we weren't fully through, but we uh, swung back a little bit to, to a question from the audience. But 
if you think about storage, uh, Samira, and you think about a building as a whole, I think you very briefly mentioned something like like independent units or. Uh, mm. What do you see as developments or as potential there if you just are free to think? Uh, how much connection would you need to the grid or to whatever? How much can you couple? Sector coupling was mentioned very early in the beginning mm. already. Like um, giving a number or... Well, maybe, or so what, what, so what do you think is possible if you yeah. think about the building in a new mm. way, not just uh, a building where all kinds of leads come in and things go out, mm. but if you have more... Uh, building of the future with lots yeah. of integrated. So, um, what actually what I would like to see is, in, especially in um, like urban areas and cities, that we really use all surfaces of the building. So um, I think you was talking about um, only like roofs. So I would like to correct it: is the roof and the facade. It's so it's the building at, at it all, and um, I think um, we could. Um, the buildings would produce in their and uh, cover like so much energy that and they have their inside the building that we can actually some of part just reuse it and at the same time like storage it in this in the backs and the downside. I think that would be like really something nice and um, at the same time that we have like um, like sharing units, sharing um, yeah like a, like a living building like an uh, um, like an organic. Um, I think, um, solidarity building, or something like that, would be uh, nice. Yeah, so there was. Um, I would think, and even like not connected to the grid, so being actually decentralized and um, autonom, there would be something. Um, I would think buildings would be uh, much um, better, better in use, uh, and not um, like having uh, extra infrastructure from outside. And I think that's even a cost of a cost fact. And um, yeah. That's, uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe this I'll is closely on. connected to you, Mr. Mindrup, to uh, how much could you integrate, how much coupling could you do, how much solar heating or other heating, electric heating at least, or cooling, uh, how much you, um, transport and electric vehicles could you connect? Is there some kind of view that you, that you would like to bring forward or would like to people to vote for in the next election? I think there are a lot of possibilities and uh, I think it's very important to look at the district, we, we call it district concepts, and uh, to look what you can harvest in the summer and uh, with storage, uh, seasonal storage to bring it to the winter. And, uh, and uh, we have uh, very interesting pilot projects and uh, I think it's, it's possible to have a 70 to 80 percent of the energy and not only the electricity use, uh, the whole energy uh, uh, you can produce uh, in the cities. And uh, it's uh, really a, a, a good opportunity. And uh, you can use heat pumps to do, to ha and uh, heat pumps are very uh, efficient, and heat pumps you, with electricity and heat pumps, um, you uh, can have a lot of energy efficiency. And I, I hope that the sector coupling uh, uh, really goes forward and uh, this is about our regulation. We, we changed a lot of in uh, a few months ago with our energy uh, law for buildings and I'm very optimistic that uh, we can go forward and it, it's always a combination. It's a combination between, um, between uh, uh, PV and uh, uh, the harvesting in the, uh, in the cities. It's a combination with insulation. You need insulation, uh, but you don't need too much insulation because it must be affordable and uh, storage and, and heat pumps. So, so it's, it's always uh, important to see the, the, the regional and the local situation and then um, I have to have an, an, a good uh, uh, concept uh, together with um, uh, 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 the people in the region and produce so much energy uh, that is possible. And uh, it is, normally it gets cheaper and cheaper because, uh, as you told, we, ha we have the possibility to harvest uh, the sun and uh, in the future we will have more sun and maybe a lot of less insulation. But it's always the combination you have to think about. And... Uh, we are uh, uh, working together uh, with big companies uh, on, uh, this, uh, uh, on this topic and they say to us, change the regulation and we will do it. And uh, the tenants organization, they encourage us too because it's, it's cheaper for the tenants and for affordable housing. So I'm optimistic and yeah, in Germany, it depends on the situation. 60 to 80% is possible in the cities. Mm -hmm. I think the... Um, um 
I think the overall energy use is about 20% electricity so far, classically, and the rest is uh, more heating, cooling and transport. We, we have 2,500 gigawatts energy use in Germany and gross uh, electricity is 590, so a little bit more, but uh, in, the, in the future I think we will have uh, some difference. I think we will have 1,600 gigawatts electricity in the system because we, we want to electrify the transport system, electric cars, uh, the public transportation, we want to uh, electrify uh, the heating system, heat pumps, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, and district heating concepts, uh, power to power to heat, and the industry. The industry uh, does need a lot of more electricity because uh, also high temperature projects. And then we heard about hydrogen, so the electricity consumption will increase enormously in Germany from uh, 600 to 1,600. But the efficiency is combined with the use of electricity because electricity is efficient. And mm -hmm. so this is the way, and I think uh, it's the most cost-effective way to have uh, climate protection and, uh, and uh, uh, to have the, uh, the wealth, uh, or, or what can we say, uh, to, to have uh, Germany as an industrial uh, country uh, to, uh, to have a good future, to, ha to have the climate protection and uh, the, uh, to be a, an industrial country. So we have to combine it. But this is a, an all Awful political debate in Germany uh, too, because we have a target for the use of electricity, but only in the electricity sector. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a, in, in the moment, a very important political debate is uh, uh, how much 65% uh, is, is, uh, is, is the target for the electricity sector, for the electricity sector, but 65% of what? And uh, uh, I'm, I think, as I mentioned, the electricity consumption must increase for, for climate protection reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think that, uh, that makes uh, very good sense. Uh, I see a question from the audience, and uh, there was another one that I wanted to connect to what you just said, Mr. Mindrup. And both questions are for you, uh, Simon. One is, can Profscat PV also be used at the building skin? And the other one was... How much potential do you see for actual, uh, not just helping an uh, industrial nation to remain an industrial nation and, and at the same time transforming the energy system, but also for job creation in solar directly? So, two different questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I think the, the first one can be answered quite uh, shortly. I think the answer is, is yes, un unless you mm -hmm. correct me. I think uh, it can, of course, be also used in, in building integrated PV. I think um, there's uh, another... Um, Polish startup uh, in, in in Poland, and they're working on building integrated uh, perovskite technology. So, I think that's um, an exciting t uh, exciting topic as well. Um, uh, the the other question was uh, regarding job creation in yes. yeah in, in in Europe. Well, I, I think um, factories um, in uh, or photovoltaic factories um, that are state of the art today they. Um, uh, have such a high level of automation that uh, they can be um, they're quite independent of um, labor cost, for example. So they can be uh, anywhere in the world. And actually, um, we are here in in Germany have the advantage that we have um, such a strong um, background in tool manufacturing. Uh, so so the, um, the lots of the know-how um, once it ca comes from um, research um, is actually in the um, process and the, how, how to ma uh, make the r uh, right tools. Like, for example, Meyer Boger, um, the one a good example, they had so much um, know how um, about the processes and made the best tools, and now they want to um, actually keep this know how for themselves and <laughs> um, start manufacturing um, modules here in Germany. So Instead um, of selling the instead tools. Of China. Yeah, instead of, yeah, yeah so, so lots of the know how is in the tool. Mm -hmm. You want to add something? No, I think it's an interesting development. Maya Burger is really interesting because they, I think they have two plants in Germany. They started manufacturing and uh, yeah, talked with them. And I think this is a good development. Mm -hmm. and yes. but, they, but they, I think, uh, politics has to encourage them. But many people in Germany think there's, <laughs> there's no future for solar industry in Germany. But it's it's an awful mistake, I think. As you said, we have a potential and uh, we have to use it and we must use it. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the reasons, of course, uh, 
initially was that there was a very high support, strategic support from the Chinese, for instance, or the Taiwanese uh, with relatively low capital costs, so they could invest uh, very largely. Another factor which, uh, which initially played a role was, um, was the cost, but that's diminished very strongly. And the third factor is, of course, the having the supply chain and, of course, the, at least the workers that you do have to have a skilled workforce also for your supply chain. And I think that's uh, still true. And it connects to actually one of the further questions that I saw from the audience about technology transfer at HHB. I think, Steve, you are working with industry quite a lot. Can you say yeah. some, some words on that and so what forms we... Yeah, so I, I think the question was about what we do at Helmholtz and, uh, and how do we collaborate with industry, right, to, to also to transfer knowledge uh, and to transfer the technology. Um, so yes, we, we do work with uh, uh, industry and uh, there's one good example here, right? So we do, uh, we do have candidates that we, with, that we teach and then they go into industry, have good positions there. So that's, uh, that's for sure one thing we can do at, a, at the institute. So teaching people and training people and uh, providing the knowledge. Also, of course, uh, providing publications, uh, so open publications and then the data can be used by everybody in the world, but also by local industry. And uh, since since this topic of perovskite uh, tandem solar cells is such a hot topic and it's such fastly evolving over time now, and there's there's such a strong potential for market entry in in the next years, there's strong interest from industry. Um, so w we do have collaborating partners and uh, we do have projects together, and then we try to uh, try to see what we can further develop in in terms of scalability, um, uh, stability, efficiency, etc. So. Also, there is a strong technology transfer. Mm -hmm. So it's both in results as well as people. Yes, exactly. Transfer. Okay, I understand. And Samira, one one question to you: It's not directly technology transfer; it's also mm -hmm. know-how transfer. You yeah. run, or you with uh, some others, you run the this, this uh, Beratungsbüro, so this advice bureau, to actually bring know-how uh, across for the integration of PV in buildings. Do you see that there's a lot of demand for that? Yeah, so um, it's, we are now since 2019, now nearly one year, um, we are in this consulting office for building integrated photovoltaics, where we train and educate architects, even the industry and um, planners. And um, I see there is a big demand since we started. We have really nearly uh, a huge, also really a lot of projects coming in, even from smaller ones like semi-detached houses and to high-rise buildings, and even like smaller architectural studios until really big architectural like infrastructures. We're really asking for how can we implement photovoltaic in our buildings and. Um, we see there is a big um, um, need for no knowledge transfer and um, even it's technical but even economical and but um, we see even like this aesthetic part we are working on so there is a big demand and I think we, um, it's, um, we are sometimes like full of work <laughs> there, that we have to try to fulfill all these needs and I think um, that's a really good project has to be started. Um, that we see that now architects are even involved in science. So we are even, uh, we see like um, we have new questions uh, like what we need on PV elements, what, uh, what does a PV um, module um, has to fulfill for architecture and not the way around. And I think this is a really nice um, a view that we have now um, through this consulting office because now we have new um, properties, so we have new um, like requirements on the material, so we need not glass glass modules. Architects want glass and um, wood or wood coated with perovskite. It's, uh, so it's like new um, like new material thinking even, and um, that's um, it's, yeah really great to know. At the same time, it would be even great <laughs> to have it. Yeah. So if you would yeah. have to choose, what would be the most important factor, if there is one, mm. more information to the building community, yes. better products, mm -hmm. or better regulation? Um, it's all, all in one, <laughs> actually. It's yeah. not one. Like dominating, yeah, regulation is important to, um, to make actually easier to implement them in. So just like concrete and we, uh, we know how to build it, we know how to put it in. The, all the construction behind it is um, well known. And so we need kind of the same twist. 
at the same time we need new materials because now we have like um, I think it's diff it's difficult that not architect are even involved in this research process because then the industry comes and have the idea of what has what does uh, module size looks like because you can produce it in a reliable way but then an architect is standing in front of it and seeing the sizes and they are limited and they're trying to fit it in their design and it's, it's not so easy, so I think it would be really great if this part will work together. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, which colors? Is, is it possible that to be perovskite to be red or blue or, I mm -hmm. don't know, and um, flexible or can yeah. it, I don't know, turn and twist? So it's, um, I think the combination is the, f also it, it, I think it's the different steps. So regulation for the fast part and then for the research part, like new um, corporations, yeah. Maybe as a, of course we're, we're nearing the end uh, of the discussion. I, I still would have um, um, one question that I'd like to put to Mr. Mindrup. Of course, the energy transition is not easy. It's not just about technology, and it's also about information. It's also about vested interests, capital, etc. The energy industry 20, 30, 50 years ago was relatively simple. It was former state-owned companies, very centralized, and uh, they resisted. This kind of change, I think it's fair to say, to the maximum possible extent. Are you hopeful? Do you see a change in these in these these bigger company in the energy industry as a whole? Uh, do you look forward to to a bright future, or do you see lots and lots of problems? Uh, so, what would be on the balance your, uh, of course, especially for solar, but I think for renewable in general? Uh, um. I think the energy companies, they know that the future is renewable. They, they know it, also the big ones. But uh, they really uh, don't agree with me or they disagree with me because I think there will be a centralized energy world and a decentralized energy world. We will have both together because the industry has a, will have a high demand on electricity and uh, as I said, the in, um, uh, the demand for electricity will increase enormous and I think we need both. We need the de decentralized uh, energy world, we need the cooperatives, we need the municipality owned and the big ones, they will have to have enough space to make good business. And in the moment, uh, uh, the centralized energy world is fighting against the decentralized and this is really an awful problem because uh, uh, we to told about it, the, the, the uh, harvesting from the sun in the, in the cities, the decentralized energy. We need both and I think the big companies, we have to understand that it's necessary to go both paths and uh, if they don't agree, with it, it's, this will be a really a hard and tough fight and uh, I think it's, it's really necessary to have people's energy for the acceptance of climate protection because you won't have acceptance if uh, people have an awful bureaucracy to harvest the sun uh, from their uh, own roofs and if they are not allowed to do it and uh, I think we have to uh, decide it and uh, as I mentioned the European Commission they are on our side for the decentralized uh, as we call it uh, citizens energy bürger energy in Germany but some of your old uh, companies we only want to change the way in the new renewable way world, and this is not, it's not possible. And we have to have a new regulation. Okay, thank you very much. So, optimism, but, but careful optimism, I would say. Yes, summarize. I know the guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe f as a final word, since this is the Berlin Science Week and that's the, uh, the frame we're in, the, I should give. Uh, oh, one of the, so the, the lead scientists in the round, I guess all of you have some scientific background, but maybe Steve, uh, you started with the, the fact that you, uh, it's important to inspire people. Do you see lots of potential? Do, are you hopeful as well or that you can inspire sufficient amounts of people so that the that societal uh, pressure will be so large that solar can actually break through with all its full potential? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic looking into the future and I'm pretty sure that more and more renewables, but especially also more and more solar will be uh, primary energy sources for not only us in Germany, but also worldwide. So I think uh, like a sonar, solar panel and uh, integrated or flexible, whatever sources of PV will, will be created in, in different devices that we have and in our houses, homes, uh, cars, potentially cell phones even further. 
tens whatever applications. So there will be so much more solar in the future, and I think it will become uh, a standard product. And also our kids will grow up with solar. It's, it it will become something that is strongly uh, I I normal, right? So yeah, clear. Yes, there will be a bright future for solar. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. How can I not uh, agree with that? Uh, so, I would first of all, like you for for viewing, of course, but also I'd like to ask, uh, uh, thank the panelists very much. So, Samira, Simon, Mr. Mindrup, and Steve, thank you all very much for sharing your ideas on solar. Of course, uh, we are probably not able to answer all your questions. I think over time uh, we would be able, if you have very pressing ones, you can always reach us. Uh, you can certainly always uh, reach our uh, uh, our parliamentary. Uh, representatives, of course, any time, uh, but of course, if you have any remaining points that you'd like to bring in to us or to our attention, of course, you're free to fill it in the chat and it will be read by the people in the background that you cannot see, but also the people in the background. I'd like to thank for organizing this uh, round and, uh, as I said, you for watching and I wish you all a very uh, pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.